You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. Um, we are being joined today by Grant, uh, Glenn and Julie Anderson. Anyway, 13 years ago, the Anderson's family life was turned upside down when Grant, Grant was on his way home from a Bible school in Detroit, no, sorry, in uh, Canada, when he had a horrific accident that, that left him with traumatic brain injuries and, and multiple other injuries to his body. And the medical professionals didn't believe he would live and today, what we're going to hear is the story of their struggles and victories that they've had through suffering that, that Grant and his family have been through for the last 13 years. We're going to hear how their music, their faith, and their prayers and determination to make the most of every moment has led them on a journey of healing and amazing growth. So uh, welcome to, to you guys, to, to the Anderson family. Really well, thanks for having us. Thank you. I want to read a Bible verse, a, a, a few verses. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7 to 13. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we all have had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good so that we, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees, make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. I think that really nicely introduces the story that you, you are all going to share with us this morning, this afternoon, this evening. <laughs> I'm going to get so confused. <laughs> Let's start with the, with the first question, Julie. This is for you. What was life like for your family before the accident? Before the accident? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, before the accident, we were um, a busy, active family, like many families. Um, we uh, have four children. Uh, our oldest um, at the time was 25, and we had a 20 um, three-year-old, and we had a, a 20-year-old, which is Grant, and then we had a nine-year-old, so we had um, a big span with our last child, and we, Glenn had um, just lost his job that he had for 34 years, so we were in a, a, a time of transition, and Glenn and Grant and our daughter Hannah, the 23-year-old, uh, and I were all at school. We, Glenn and I decided to go back and renew um, my teaching certificate, Glenn was going to get his teaching certificate. Um, and so we were very busy and um, we had, you know, kind of suffered the loss of a job, what that emotionally does to a family. We tried to move forward and just keep plugging along. Cassie and David were getting married that year. Cassie, my daughter, that's on today. Um, uh, she's my oldest. She had just gotten married a couple years before. And um, so we, yeah, we had a big change of life already, and Glenn had gotten his teaching certificate and was ready to get a job, but um, God had other plans for us. Mm. So, <clears throat> hang on, I'm going to move this. <clears throat> I don't know if I mentioned it, we were all four at the same university, which was common. In downtown Detroit. Yeah. yeah. What, what were you studying? I'm a math tutor. So, I mean, a math teacher, so I tutor now, but I'm um, a math teacher. Glenn, history. Grant is music. Or, or vo vocal, vocal education. Hmm. And he had three years, done of or three years of college done already at 20 years old. He used to drop me off at my class and say, Mom, did you do your homework? 
<laughs> and uh, um, my other daughter was studying uh, engineering and psychology, and she got her degree eventually in, in engineering. And um, then uh, my other daughter was a music teacher at the time. She got her degree in music. Wow. Oh, so, so you were all studying together? Yeah. 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 How, how long were you doing this for? A couple of years. A couple of years? Mm -hmm. So, Glenn, can you tell us about what happened? What led up to that accident? Well, it was um, the, the proverbial knock at the door that nobody wants to, to have. And it happened to us. And really, it changed the trajectory of our, of our whole life in so many ways. It was on a Thursday evening, and we knew that Grant was supposed to be coming back from the youth conference for a commitment that he made with a bunch of young people on a program that he was doing. And we hadn't heard from him. It was, it was getting late, and we were kind of getting a little worried, but not too worried. We called one of the friends of his that, that uh, he was meeting up with, and he said, well, Grant will be here. Don't worry, and I tried to... to, to calm our fears and and then we we didn't really you know think about it much more after that and then i think it was uh between 10 and 11 a police officer came to the front door and you know the the, the shock first of all that an officer is on your front door and then the reality hits home that something's happened and we and we knew all of our kids were accounted for except for grant and he didn't have any details about any of the circumstances other than to say that your vehicle was involved in a, an accident and a young man is severely injured because they couldn't find any identification on Grant. So they ran the plate number in Ontario, contacted the local police here who came out to contact us and reported that Grant was in critical condition in London Victoria Hospital in Ontario, which is about two hours from here, across the border into Canada. And uh, of course, you know, Panic City, you just you just shut down and and uh, kind of freak out. Our nine-year-old, you know, police officer at the front door, he wanted to come down and see what's going on. Me, I'm thinking the officer is saying critical condition, and I'm thinking fatal. You know, it just like your mind just goes bonkers when something yeah. like that happens. Yeah. And then it was the big rush after that to, uh, to, to just to get up to Canada as fast as we could. Uh, we, we called the hospital and they wouldn't give us any information other than the fact that Grant was still alive. That's all that they would tell us. And uh, we took off right away and, and drove up to Canada. And very strangely, we got stopped on the freeway by another accident in, in Canada that shut the freeway down for must have been an hour, an hour and a half. We were stuck in a stop position and we couldn't proceed any further. And, and our phones weren't working because it was in Canada. So Julie gets out of the car and goes up to visit the car in front of us and asks if she could borrow their phone to call the hospital to see if Grant's still alive. And then to flag down an officer to see if he would let us, you know, through to drive up this shoulder and they, and they wouldn't. But, uh, we finally got there about two o'clock in the morning, and and Grant was in a in a coma, um, unresponsive. The um, you know everything was very dire, and, and and clearly he had a very very serious head injury amongst some other things. And they did not give a good prognosis. It was you know basically um, in a veiled way that that he was dying. And as time progressed, we saw that. The, uh, the pressure in his brain kept increasing, and eventually it, it, it pressures, puts pressure on your brain stem, and then you, you, you just die because the pressure is too great. And, uh, you know, we're at the same time trying to, uh, to uh, you know, contact relatives and family to let them know they're, they're scattered all over the place. And our daughter Hannah that Julie mentioned was still on Manitoulin Island, and you're kind of incommunicado in when you're up there. So we had to try to get a message to her, and then uh, you know our extended family, my parents and Julie's, Julie's uh, mother and, and and other relatives about uh, what's going on, and and 
um, you know, the next two and a half, three days, it was all in the hospital up in London, praying and and. Um, we actually said goodbye to him. They came and said his his losing his dilation in his eyes, and uh, he was dying. So. Um, went into a small room and all cried and prayed. And um, then I, I think we told, told you this um, before that they had a, a uh, prayer meeting in Detroit with the four ecclesias, which we were very grateful for. And at that time, um, it so happened that um, what some doctors from our area called doctors in, from in Canada had said that we they would approve getting grant in, back into the States and they let us do a craniectomy which is they take, uh, they cut open the head, pull back the skin, it's pretty graphic, take out a piece of bone like a pumpkin and allow that brain to, to uh, swell. And they said there was a chance he was gonna die if we did that. And I said, well, he's gonna die or he's gonna die. So <laughs> to yeah. us, it wasn't much of a choice. Let's at least give it a chance. Mm -hmm. And so they did that and it's, it spared his li life enough to get him back into the States. But then we got into the states. They told us to let him die um, because they said he was he was going to be at best a vegetable. And in the meantime, Grant had not moved at all. Yeah. Can we go back one step and just just hear from you, Grant? What 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 happened from your perspective? You were you were on your way home from the youth camp. I was home, going home early because I was busy a busy young. Young man, a little older than a boy. Yeah, I was a young man, young man. I was 20, and I was, I had so much to do. I didn't keep my head in one place for long, so I wasn't really thinking about the distant future. I was always in the present, but yet I had the hope in front of me of the kingdom and Christ appearing. So I had joy and in my fiber, but all uncertainty to where my life would go. If that's a short way of saying it. Well, you yeah. prayed on the beach. Yes, I, I did. I, I can recall praying on the beach at the, the camp, going outside by the big campfire where the holly usually, holly usually is, and praying to the stars in the sky and saying, God, please help me decide what to do. Should I go this direction or that direction? And God answered my prayer that night, not in the way I would have expected, but in the hospital, I, I, I knew yeah, it would be okay. And then God heard my prayer and decided for me. And, and thankfully, God sent numerous, infinite amount of supporters and brothers and sisters visiting and, and comforting me. There was actually uh, a doctor in the vehicle not far back from Grant's accident that came out and uh, uh, held his, his head in his hands, he actually got into where the, um, I don't know if you saw the picture that, that uh, just a few minutes ago, he, they, after they lifted the truck off of Grant, he, his, his van was right under the truck. This man held Grant's uh, head in his hands and said a prayer because he saw all Grant's Bible things and said a prayer. I think that encouraged Grant. Grant does not remember a lot of it, but he does remember people saying prayers and he does remember people singing to him. And then there was also another, um, there was a um, nurse, an emergency nurse who also came out and helped. And we believe that these, you know, we believe they were there um, to, to help Grant keep. And coincidentally, they were from. One of them was from our from area. Detroit, Detroit, not far from where I worked, where, not far from where we live. In fact, we were able to, to uh, actually contact that emergency room physician who, was in the car with Grant and uh, and, uh, and and confirm that story and and hear from him and he definitely was glad to hear how well Grant was doing. But you can see from the pictures here how how uh, devastating the actual accident was. They had to they had to, had to jack the semi truck up off of uh, off of the van. That's a van that Grant was in. And you can see that you know, that, that the damage was all the way back to. He, to the back seat. <laughs> it was uh, yeah. kind of frightening when I actually saw it for the first time. Glenn wouldn't yeah. let me see the pictures for a couple years. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of, I said, you don't want to see the pictures, Julie. <laughs> nah. All right, we'll escape it. 
But what, what was what was fascinating was the actual uh, number of people that came through. We were in 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 uh, London. London for three days, okay. five days. Yeah, the air was wonderful to us. Yeah, so. great support locally, and then just literally hundreds of of uh, brothers and sisters from all over came into London. Uh, friends of Grant's. Uh, school. school classmates, his professor in the music department, um, community theater. The they community came theater. They they came up to 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 visit. I mean, even though Grant was unresponsive, they they came to in case they were saying their goodbyes and 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 uh, and to talk to us. It was just a phenomenal support. But it really agitated the staff, didn't it, Julie? Yeah, the yeah well, they we were letting people through <laughs> to say to talk to them, and two people at a time. And one nurse came up to me and said, why are you doing this? You know, he's just going to die. And I said, you know, well, <laughs> I was kind of hoping that he wasn't. But if he is, I want people to be able to say goodbye to him. And I wanted Grant to know that people were there in support of him. Uh, one of his friends actually brought a mattress and stayed at, at, in the lobby on the floor of the hospital. Um, while for seven the whole time. Brian. Fantastic. Wow. Yeah, it's such a lot of support, Grant. It's, uh, uh, that's, that's really amazing. Really a blessing. And uh, we had his uh, really good friend, Ryan Mutter, came up and spent five days up there from um, Virginia, uh, Baltimore. Baltimore. Sorry. Baltimore, yeah. And, and, Virginia, yeah. and um, so we were very thankful for the brothers and sisters yeah. and friends. Yeah. So and as we're preaching. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, you, you say. We it was a, a good, comforting and visiting the sick is also where you're preaching because they wondered why, how is this person having so much support? And that's how a Christian, a Christian should, should live and to be a testament to Christ visiting the sick. And that's what we should be known for is the healing group of people that comfort and uplift each other. And what's amazing to build on what Grant's saying is the the fact that throughout his recovery, over a period of a couple of years, it came back that there were people who were actually influenced by how you know Grant recovered, but also how the family and all of these brothers and sisters and friends responded to this actual need of Grant's. It 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 influenced them. It, some of them had changed their life. Some of them remembered it years later. We went back up to London Victoria Hospital, and, and a couple of people there remembered, you know, the circumstances regarding Grant being there, you know, all you know a year and a half previously. So people remembered all of these things, and uh, and some of them um, have kept in touch even up to this day. Wow. Yeah. So at what point did it look like there was going to be a change and that Grant might recover? In a little while. Um, he didn't he was he didn't move for almost two weeks. And uh, we did at two weeks. He still had um, not a trach yet. He they have all the pipes or tubes in your mouth to breathe. And yeah, that was coming up head too. And food, they fed him through the mouth intravenously and in the mouth. Um, and so after two weeks, this gets infected. And that was when one of the doctors said, you know, we could put a trach in for breathing and we could put a, a tube in his stomach to eat, but I wouldn't recommend it. And um, we had um, had a decision to make. And the doctor in front of everybody in a lobby said to us, um, well, are you prepared to take care of a vegetable for the rest of his life? And will your children take care of him after you're gone? And I, you know, I was like, I know we're not prepared for that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I'm not ready to say goodbye yet. So uh, I hadn't really thought about, I mean, well, all of us hadn't really thought about it. So we discussed it as a family and we decided to, to have the, the operation done. And um, as it turned out, that very day, Grant, once he got all these things out of his mouth, 
and he got to sleep. By the way, they wake you up every hour or two, push on his thumb, thump on his chest. Are you awake? Are you awake? They pinch on his toes. They do this. He never gets to sleep or rest. So he got four hours of sleep after this anesthesia. And then he moved his thumb for the first time when they asked him. And the doctor didn't believe it. Said, you want a Reader's Digest story? It really didn't happen because he didn't see it. And Grant wouldn't do it for the doctor. I wonder why. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's why I believe Grant was in there because I think Grant kind of knew. Like if, if we would, if they ever talked about dying, all his monitors would would go a little, little yeah, change. Right. And uh, and then when he first started opening his eyes, he would follow us with his eyes, and they said, no, no, that's just a reaction. <laughs> But we knew it. So it was a long time. That was two weeks. Then he started to move slowly. Um, and it took about six weeks before they considered him out of a coma. They Then they started covering up his trach to teach him to talk. And he could say ma and pa and things like that. And we were really excited with that because we didn't know if he could talk. And then one day he covered up his trach. And I was showing my sister showing off just like you would a little kid. Look, he can talk. And he, and he says, I love you, mom, and I'm sorry. <laughs> we just about <laughs> fell on the floor. Um, so then we knew he was in there, but he, you know, and then of course you get all excited thinking, oh yeah, he's just going to pop up and life will go on as normal. But it didn't because he had a lot of brain damage and um, his memory was affected very, very poorly. You'd been on two trips before your accident. Yeah. I went to Jamaica for a mission or pitching trip. And I also went to Ireland with my university choir and didn't recall any of those after my accident. But thankfully, it came back to me as and It took about a years. year for him to remember those events. And him and I wrote music together. And one of the songs that we wrote just before his accident, about three or four months before the accident, they were singing at, at the, the camp. At the conference. And he had to leave early, so he couldn't sing with them. And um, they... Uh, um, he could remember the song when he woke up, which is amazing. That's why God wow. says to sing. It stays in your brain in both parts of his, his language it's center. God's word, it fills all your mind with, mm -hmm. and it will stay with you forever. He couldn't remember writing it. And uh, he, he didn't remember where we were when we wrote it or anything, but he did remember the song. And we would sing it together. So what part did music play in the in the healing process? Because I know it played a big part. I mean, you're all very musical. You were half of your university studying music, teaching it, or whatever. Um, what what part did it play in the healing process? I did a bunch of research on this for my senior project for college university, and there's so much proof that music is the best recreational activity to do. I, recreational activities for anyone to do because it crosses both hemispheres even if there's a damaged part like people for people with old old age dementia or strokes or in brain injuries you can relearn to speak by people can sing sometimes most times when they can't talk when they can't talk a lot of yeah. times the music's wired that way we were we speak with the rhythm, we walk with the cadence, our heart beats with the tempo. We're made to sing and have a rhythmic musical beat itself. It also helps you memorize things. Yeah. And so when Grant could not remember the order he was supposed to do something in therapy, uh, we would have him sing. He sang a lot in his therapies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, you can It distracted it. him from pain, right? It distracted yeah. him from pain. It comforted, yeah, comforted my emotions. Also, it was a good study study benefit when I sang the notes and answers to studying the lessons. I, when he was in college, you know, a lot of his his work we put um, that he had to memorize, like uh, his logic class, if P then Q, if not Q then not P, and <laughs> all of those things. It's a bunch of rules like that. Q, um, a, a Q. Yeah, we we I we made songs out of them. Yeah, it's. Well, that's the way methods. So that's why we think it's important that God said, uh, why God said to sing, is it's because it really puts it deep into your 
your whole being. It's one of the most recorded commandments. And we as in our collegiate community don't always take the race seriously. Some some brothers do, like you know, Peter Clausen is a strong component for it. I think it's it's you only the, the, the sorry. You sang a lot too, uh, too great when he was while he was healing too, didn't you, Julie? Yes, in, in the early days um, when he was still in the coma, we brought a CD player in and uh, played all sorts of music that he was used to, including Christmas music that we would play at Christmas. I mean. Uh, I know there might be people that are a little, uh, uh, I don't know what people's feelings are about that, but we're, we're, uh, we played him Christmas music and we played him um, our Bible music we wrote Bible and then school Bible school programs, sang hymns out of the hymn book. Um, his favorite one was Grant Us Thy Peace. Peace to us <laughs> and, really like that one. and um yeah we 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 tried to wake him up as many ways as we could and singing definitely in fact grant um had written some music for this pro this event that he was coming home for and we hadn't heard that music and he recorded some very fun songs in this uh in for this event that he was working on and we heard him for the first time ourselves and we played him for him because that was some of the last things that he did. Yeah. yeah. The music anchored me to different points in my life. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. One Sorry. thing that that was that was significant when he went back to school, his first uh, class that he took back at university was a choir class which he audited because we knew how important music was to him. We knew how supportive the music department at Wayne State was to Grant, and that worked out really well. And and then the next semester, he took the same class actually for credit, and and did very well in the class. But I can remember um, a couple semesters later, he had to take a conducting class, and that was quite a challenge for him. That was hard. And, uh, in in his first semester back at university, he, he took a conducting class, and we made a conscious decision that that everything would be therapy. Um, all of his back to school and all of his activities at home, everything would be geared to a therapeutic approach for his recovery. And and he was having trouble with this conducting class. He just couldn't get the you know the one, one two one two. <laughs> and he was really good conductor prior to his accident. That's right. Yes. And, and, and the professor even told Hannah, who was helping him, said, uh, I'm not conducting a therapy class here. Little did he know he was. Because <laughs> uh -huh. Grant eventually got it. And later on, later on, the, the, the professor was getting frustrated with the lack of progress of some of the students. And he, and, uh, and he said, if Grant can do this, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> You're an inspiration all the way through, Grant. What's that? Say that again. You're an inspiration all the way through. Oh. <laughs> if you look up on YouTube, uh, Grant Anderson conducting, you'll see one of his first times conducting. Hannah is holding him with the gate belt. Mm. Yeah, well, I think we'll put that link up a little bit later. So, yeah, we'll do that. Cool. So, did it cause big faith questions? Well, for Grant, he was in a coma, so he doesn't remember the early parts real well. Um, I can speak to me, and then you can speak to you. Sure. Grant was going to Manitoulin Island he, uh, to get his head you know, connected with what he was supposed to be doing, the right thing. He, he always thought about uh, God and uh, encouraged other people to, and I just... I just felt that this must be from God because he was on a good tra trajectory, although maybe that was just wishful thinking on my part. Maybe it was because in despair you turn to God. But in the early days, um, I just prayed that God either would let him live or help me to survive if he didn't. So that was mine and, and and when we realized it was going to be a longer journey then it, then it is a little bit more difficult um 
because we believe that Grant was a miracle. Uh, but then when somebody approached us and said, you know, uh, we were praying for a miracle. We didn't get a miracle. Why did you get a miracle? And we didn't get a miracle. I met lots of horrific and devastating injured and disabled people and why I made it and they didn't. Or they had less damage. They had less damage. Yeah, but some that through illness or cancers or different things that just don't survive at all. Missing people. arms and legs and spinal cord injuries. Yep, we've seen a lot. Yeah. So, um, you know, I I can't answer that question. Mm -hmm. I just know that uh, every road has its good points and has its bad points and has its hard moments. And it has it's twists and turns, ups and downs, but they're all leading towards the same place. Yep. Yeah. Old, old. Well, I was just going to say. Kind of, kind of like Julie, the the you're so overwhelmed with the with the emotions of the moment that you're just praying that 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 God would spare Grant's life without you know thinking about any of the consequences or any of the of the questions as to why. And then when it was uh, you know fairly assured that he wasn't going to die, that's when you start being more reflective and and applying. You know, the, the the exact situation that you're in to your knowledge of scripture and you know it, it comes down to that you can't do that I mean you just don't know you, you know God works in our lives but to say for sure that you know this or that is happening at the direction of God and and what's going on you, you can't do it in your life assuredly just as you can't do it in anyone else's life when life when you look at the difficult circumstances that they're going through and, and i think i just fell back on you know, the, the the principle that you know we see in romans 8 that, that all things work together for those that love god but you just don't know how that is in your own life but you're self-assured because of your faith that 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 has to be true but i don't know how it's true in our life at the moment and then you pray that maybe in some way you get some insights into that as the years go by. And then, of course, in the kingdom, you know, Lord willing, you're going to know all the answer to those big questions. But it's just, uh, you know, th that question is very personal. And, and, you know, each of us has our own response to it, just as anybody else would to trials and, and difficulties in their life and how it, it challenges their faith. One thing yeah. Grant said to me about, uh, but after we brought him home five months later, he was in a lot of pain. And uh, he said to me, um, Mom, why didn't you just let me die? And I had to really think about that. I had to really think about when I prayed for him to live, um, was I praying it for it for me? Or was I praying it uh, really for what was best for him? Because it's a bigger road for him to walk. I mean, it's changed our lives, but it's a bigger road or I should say to not walk, but now he's walking, so that's a good thing. Um, but I didn't know what to say. And I said, well, Grant, I guess I was just thinking of myself. I didn't you know, really think at the time how it would affect you. I just didn't want to lose you. And, and I said, I guess that was pretty selfish. And he says, no, Mom, it wasn't selfish. Um, I would have done the same thing if it was you. But he, he was struggling. And, yeah, it's not an yeah. easy road. No. no. So how did it? How have you seen your 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 family's your own or your family's perspective change on life or faith or community since since the accident? Could you repeat that? How did it? How, how have you how have you seen your own or your family's perspective on life or faith or community sort of change since the accident? You know. Mm -hmm. Before the accident, you're sort of like, you know, carrying on like life was normal. But now it's sort of, I would expect, you know, like even with the hundreds of visitors you had, even the first few weeks. Um, I mean, wow, you know, that changes your perspective. Yeah, lot. it does change you. It, it, it does. And I, I think it, it, it affected us individually in a lot of ways. One way that it affected me was it changed my perspective on how I view other people. I'm more... Um, I, I think I was always sympathetic, but not really showing much empathy for people. I was, I was, you know, kind of um, on the go and and uh, and impatient with people. 
And now being with Grant for all these years, the, the empathy comes through that I'm more patient and I'm willing to, to think, put myself in the shoes of somebody else and give that person the benefit of the doubt Definitely. instead of being critical or to be, you know, uh, judgmental. And so it, I think that's one, one lesson that I've learned. And, and then the other, the, the bigger thing that I've seen is just the, the wonderful outpouring of, uh, uh, within our, our ecclesial community, within the, the faith of, of our brothers and sisters and the ecclesias and the support that we've gotten in so many ways. Um, like giving talks and things. They, that, well, one example would be within a, within a year, Grant was able to give an exhortation. And it was a very substandard exhortation by anyone's, anyone's uh, measurement, especially Grant's. Physically, he had to be helped up to the platform. Physically, I had to stand next to him and run my finger along the words as he, he read them to keep his place. He's blind on the he's left side. blind on the left side of both eyes. Um, he's, he's partially paralyzed on the left side. So there was lots of issues coming in here. But the community was so embracing and, and, and giving that they supported all of that. Thank you very much. And, and, and allowed him and wanted him to do it. Because it was the you know the the love of Christ being shown through yep. to us and to him, and of course it was a great cognitive therapy for him to write and to stand up and give an exhortation, and it still is now to do that. Definitely, and, you know it's just uh, so those that's one little perspective of myself, and then a bigger perspective on our on our community where you know we saw things that that perhaps we hadn't seen before. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it's fantastic. Well, I no, I agree. I think we've uh, we're in a community of people a lot now that that have disabilities and uh, they appreciate life in a lot different way. And we've learned that also that the things that you thought were important before, the places and things that you were d doing that seemed so essential and important, take a secondary role to. A person's life and uh, I know we had like a flooded basement at one point during after his accident we were doing some construction so we could have him have a place because he couldn't get up to his bedroom and they put the pipes in wrong and one day all this water is coming into the bottom of our house I mean into our basement and all a lot of your memories a lot of your things that you store in the basement all soaking wet and um, instead of just getting all upset about it like oh you know how am i ever you just oh okay well you gotta work on this and things you throw out you throw out things you can dry out you dry out and you don't get as worked up about individual incidences that would normally have been a big uproar just material things right yeah especially material things yeah. but, but you know they could do with other things in your life to activities that you can't do or you thought you could do yeah. you know what's important Mm. Mm. Change of perspective. It is definitely. Mm -hmm. you know, Grant always says, "What it's a different road, right?" Yeah. And and it's definitely been a, a different road that's opened up so many things for all of us and for Grant too. Um, you know, I, I think you know Grant is the most positive guy that I know. He, he's hardworking. He's dedicated to to the truth and to his recovery, and it shows every single day in in the hard work that he that he puts in for. What's it, 13 years now? Yeah. Just, just amazing. Even though he really, really misses his freedom to go out and, and get in a car, do what he wants to do, go out with friends, and, you know, he has to be dependent on people picking him up or doing things, um, you know, which doesn't happen as, uh, Very humbling, but... yeah, as often as he would like. But uh, he does. He's, he, he's an example to us of uh, staying positive and, and has helped us. To, to stay on track. So we're very thankful for that. And all the way through, Grant, I see that, you know, you're, you're always there. You're, you're comforting your parents <laughs> in all of this. You know, you've got, a, you've got a heart that wants to just reach out and comfort others. And I think that is just beautiful. You know, with all that you've been through, you're the one that's reaching out to, to comfort and support others. So that's really beautiful. 
What's really interesting is when he was coming out of the coma, his right hand started moving, um, and I would often be at the side of the bed with my head on near, near his, you know, on the pillow next to his, and praying. And one day he takes his hand and he puts it on my head, and he does one of these numbers, you know, like pat and a little rub. And I was like, he's in there. I knew he was in there. He was telling me, Mom, it's going to be okay. We didn't, he didn't spoken yet. So um, he did speak. He spoke through his eyes. He spoke through the tips of his fingers. His fingers, yeah. Yeah. He said, it's wonderful. That's from laying hands on with people who are sick, is being there to hug them, kiss them. Yeah. Before Corona. Yeah, before Corona. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we can do that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, well, no. um, touch is a really important um, part of, of healing. Yeah, yes. is the definite way was I would rub Grant's yeah. feet a lot while he was in a coma, <laughs> trying to get him to oh, move. Yeah, and I, I, I love visitors guilting them into rub my feet. <laughs> I feel like that cold because it never got up in my bed. So I said, rub my feet. <laughs> the filter wasn't well, quite. We would... The filter wasn't quite there in the beginning. <laughs> so, and that's an interesting thing. Having somebody, Grant has gotten the, his filter back, but he would just say things like, why are you arguing about this? Or, uh, mom, you shouldn't get mad about that. Or, you know, just whereas kids usually are a little bit hesitant not to tell their parents things like that because <laughs> it could get them fired up a little bit. Um, if Glenn and I would argue about anything, uh, he didn't like it. And it made me think about how when you argue in front of little kids, they're not as articulate to just outwardly say. I like tact, but I got to go back. Out there, he would say exactly what he thought of something. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So we'll wrap this session up now, and we're just so thankful to you for um, spending this time to chat with us. And Thank um, you. yeah, we'll continue on our discussions in in, um, in our next session. But yeah, thank you so much for this. It's it's thank um, you. Yeah, really thank you. We really appreciate you taking Thank you so much. Yeah. You too. Thank, you. Thank you, both of you. So God just to let you know what's coming up. Next okay, week, so we, we, next, next week <laughs> we've got uh, the second part of Struggles and Victories from Suffering. Um, and then we've got a break on the 10th of August. On the 17th of August, we've got a, another exciting Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org if you enjoyed the episode then please share it with others until next time may god bless you in your studies and your walk towards god's kingdom amen